if you'd like to take a seat for a moment. And turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 62. Psalm 62, page 448 of the Church Bibles. Just sung a hymn that reminds us of the peace of the Lord even in the worst of trials and that his salvation comes to us and is with us regardless of what we now face. This psalm is along a similar theme and asks us about what we are to put our trust in. Psalm 62 To the choir master, according to Judithan, a psalm of David. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall, a tottering fence. They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. For God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. For my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. My fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances, they go up. They are together lighter than breath. Put no trust in extortion. Set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, Twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his work. Praise be to God in the reading of his word. Luke chapter 12. Those who are paying attention will know that I have already preached Luke's chapter 12. I do not intend to preach it again this morning. But there is a passage that we looked at about five or six months ago that I wish to remind us of this morning as we try and incorporate together some of the things that Jesus has had to say about our possessions. So if you turn with me to Luke chapter 12, page 818 in the Church Bibles. We're going to begin in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, someone saying to Jesus, tell my brother, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbiter, arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And I will store all my grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. 
And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouses nor barn, and yet God feeds them. And how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do a smaller thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet, I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... How much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and all these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock. For it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus' powerful words from Luke 12. As we go through the Gospel of Luke, we see themes repeated, extended, developed. We'll be coming back to the similar theme, well, the same theme, as we look at Luke 16 together. Whom do you serve? Do you serve God? Or do you serve money? Where does your allegiance lie? The answer to this question is a matter of life or death. Imagine with me for a moment, you stand at the gates of a large castle. Archers aim from the parapets and the arrow slits. You hear the neighing of horses from behind the gate. Large horses, they carry a sortie of knights ready to come forth and capture you. It is night time. You are lit up with torches from the walls. And a loud cry goes out. Who goes there? And whom do you serve? Life and death hangs in the balance. If you answer rightly, you will be welcomed into the safety and the light of the castle. But give the wrong answer and 50 arrows will be loosed in your direction. If somehow you dodge those, the riders will be upon you in moments. The night is cold and you are lost. You need to enter the castle. There is only one way in. Whom do you serve? In the flickering torchlight, you see a shining golden crown appear on the top of the parapet. You hear a faint conversation, and the herald cries out again, Tell us who you are and whom you serve. My lord, the king is about to retire to bed. Once he is gone, we will not open the gate. And he will not suffer potential enemies to stand before his gate all night. Answer now, do you serve my Lord the King or do you serve someone else? Whom do you serve? The answer to the question is a matter of life or death. This morning I speak to you of this matter of grave importance, whether you serve God or money. And the answer to this question will determine your entry into the kingdom of God. If you are certain that you know the king, then you need not worry. 
But if you are uncertain, then my hope this morning is that Jesus' words will help you determine who you serve. And if you are certain you serve money, then Jesus' words will form a very serious warning for you. Without any further delay, let us examine Jesus' words together. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 16. We're going to begin in verse 1. We will consider Jesus' question as he comes to the con- his conclusions at the end of the parable of the dishonest manager. We looked at that parable a few weeks ago. To put this question in its proper context, we're going to read from verse 1. We're going to review the parable and then examine what Jesus has to say as he develops his teaching on money and incorporates it into his wider instruction. Luke 16, beginning in verse 1. He, that's Jesus, also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do, since my master is taking my man- the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said, Take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? He said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. We looked at the parable of the dishonest manager a few weeks ago and we concluded that the thrust of what Jesus was saying was that whatever wealth we have, whatever surplus we have, we are to use it to make friends for ourselves for all eternity. That we should be wiser and shrewder and scheme harder than earthly men and women in order to see people added to the kingdom. And we should do so with a sense of urgency, knowing that the opportunity to do this work will soon close. And if you are someone who presently serves money, then that sermon may have already been difficult for you. So far as it means that Jesus' instruction is that your wealth should be used in the service of others and not for yourself. That your money, your thinking, your urgent effort should be extended not to your own pleasure, but to the winning of others for the sake of the gospel. 
And as Jesus goes on, as he builds on his challenge, he only gets stronger in his rhetoric. He's incorporating now this specific teaching on winning friends into his wider teaching on money that he's been building across the Gospel of Luke. He's further developing what we might refer to as a binary. He's going to demonstrate this morning that there is a binary choice. There is money or God. As well as having given us this instruction, as we come to the end of his teaching in this parable, we have two warnings to consider. Two warnings of what outcome we can expect if we make the wrong choice. Let's begin with the first warning, verse 10. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. And one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? For anyone concerned having read the parable of the dishonest manager, that Jesus is commending dishonest practices, the way his argument proceeds just confirms from us that Jesus is not encouraging dishonesty per se. As we concluded, the commendation is on the shrewdness, not on the dishonesty within the parable. He is not encouraging us to misuse other people's possessions. But whilst making this clear, Jesus pivots his use of the parable to remind us that we are temporary managers. What do I mean by this? Well, we touched on the one hand on the previous sermon. On the one hand, the example of the dishonest manager using someone else's wealth for his own gain demonstrates to us the importance of using wealth appropriately and the importance of being shrewd. And on the one hand, it contrasts how we might be using our wealth compared to the dishonest manager. And yet, on the other hand, Jesus then makes it clear that we are not to be dishonest. But there is some sense in which we are like the manager, so far as we are being called to temporarily manage the resources of others. If you had opportunity to read the whole Bible, you will realize there are two aspects of our time on earth that would lead us to conclude that whatever we have or whatever we think we have, we have nothing at all. What we have is not our own. The first aspect you will come across in reading your Bible that will help inform you on this matter, begins with creation. The first sentence of our Bible informs us that. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Meaning, amongst other things, that everything has been created by God. This includes us, This includes our ability to be productive and this includes what our productivity might be able to create or purchase. From the very beginning, there is nothing that we have truly earned on ourselves. There is nothing that has not been given to us. There is nothing that has not been given to us by the general grace of God in his creation. So that's the first aspect we need to bear in mind and when we consider what it is we own, that everything we have got has been given to us by God. The second aspect is summarized in Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Turn with me there if you can. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, page 518. My apologies, Ecclesiastes 2, not Ecclesiastes 6. Ecclesiastes 2, page 518. 
Ecclesiastes 2, beginning in verse 18. Solomon writes, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. Extremely negative and accurate conclusions from Solomon about our work in this life. There is much that Solomon is saying here, but what I would like to draw your attention to is the fact that what he is saying is that no matter how hard he works or how hard wisely he works, in earthly work, it is all in vain. Why? Because at some point he will die and all of his hard work will be passed on to another. Whatever he's built, whatever he's worked, whatever wealth he has accrued, He cannot take it with him. It will be passed on to someone else. And this is true of all of our earthly possessions, isn't it? We will, what we have will either be destroyed because it will prove worthless or it will be passed on. Our wealth will be used to pay our debtors or if we're very fortunate, we will leave it as an inheritance to our children. It's important to leave an inheritance to your children according to the Bible, but the point stands, there is nothing you can hold on to. The second aspect of what we need to consider when we think about what we own is that whatever we temporarily get from this earth as a gift from God, we will surely lose. We cannot take it with us. Putting these two aspects together, we see that by God's gift in creation, we are given a temporary life, temporary energy, perhaps even some possessions or even some wealth, and then it will be taken away from us. And on that day, we will be called to give an account of how we made use of what was temporarily given to us. And Jesus said, at the end of the parable of the rich fool that we read from in Luke 12. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? We will all be called to give an account, just like the dishonest manager was called to give an account. And in the same way, we have a brief opportunity to make use of God's wealth. It's not ours, it's his. And we are instructed in this parable to make use of it for the sake of winning brothers and sisters for the kingdom of God. Jesus is asking the question and it's part of this first warning that we're considering together this morning. Are you being faithful with what you've been temporarily given? Are you being faithful with what is ultimately God's? He makes this observation in verse 10. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much. The one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. In this sense, wealth in this life is a test. 
we have been given the opportunity to have temporary resources. How will we make use of them? Will we make use of them in the way that reflects God's purposes? Will we use God's money God's way? Or will we be dishonest? Will we be unfaithful to God? Will we pretend that what he has given us is actually ours, just to use for ourselves only? In God's accounting, what we have now, even the richest man, what he has now is very, very little. It's tiny. What temporary treasures we have are nothing compared to the storehouses of heaven. And what is our short life compared to eternity? But if we cannot spend what little we have now faithfully, why would God give us any more? If we do not show ourselves to be servants of God with what little we have now, how can we presume to enter his service forever? In verse 11, Jesus, Jesus uses that phrase again, the unrighteous wealth. Verse 11, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, how, who will entrust you to you the true riches? Who will entrust to you the true riches? Remember last time we were at this passage, I put forward the fact that wealth is unrighteous until it is invested righteously. And so in that sense, all hoarded earthly wealth is unrighteous. It is a misuse of funds if it is hoarded for our own security at the expense of others. In that sense, the wealth that we have does us no good. It gives us no righteousness. We are being warned here that if we misuse the wealth that is useless to us, we will never gain true riches in the kingdom. The riches that we might receive at the beginning of eternity and that we will never lose. Jesus develops this thought, thought further in verse 12. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? The subject of what we own and what we should own is much debated, particularly just during discussions, what sort of society we should be aiming for, what utopia we should work towards. What heaven on earth should we build? On the one extreme, you have those for whom heaven on earth is having total control over your own possessions and land to do with as you please, owing nothing to anyone. Taxation is theft, after all, they might say. And on the other, there are those that would build a utopia when everyone owns everything. And in the same breath, no one owns anything. Some prophesy that when such a utopia is reached, you will own nothing and be happy. God's word stands far above such debates, speaking primarily not to what this earth can be turned into, but calling us to make decisions for the age to come to build towards a true and eternal utopia. The Bible does speak to the debate on private property ownership, but the primary thing that the Bible says about the ownership of our possessions is that the wealth that we have is not, in fact, our own. So far, as I have established, that everything is ultimately God's. The Bible's vision of ownership goes beyond that of the anarchist or the communist. Rather than working towards a world where we can temporarily own things free of government interference, we are called to work for a day where we will own what will never be taken away. 
Rather than working towards a world without scarcity for our brief lives, we are called to work for a utopia where we will own all things and share all things in common without envy and without scarcity. Wealth promises that we will own things now, but the Bible promises that you have an opportunity during this life to secure treasures in heaven that you will own in a much truer and more profound way than anything you can own in this life. Yes, your new treasures will still be given to you by God, but God has assigned them to you for all eternity. All things in heaven will be from Jesus and through him and to him and shared by the heavenly community. And yet the promises of these verses is that you will possess in heaven treasures more fully and more truly than anything we think we own today. Paul speaks of the body in this way. Similarly, what is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. In the same way, all of our wealth here is perishable, but we have an opportunity to sow it like our bodies for an eternity that is imperishable. Putting all this together, we can see Jesus's question in verse 12 as a warning. And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own. And so we have Jesus' first warning this morning. If you are unfaithful with your earthly wealth, you will not be given anything to own in the life to come. If you are unfaithful with your earthly wealth, you will not be given anything that is your own in the life to come. So that's the first warning. The second warning brings us to our question. Verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus makes it clear to us that we have a straight choice between two masters. One is God and the other is wealth. To be clear, this word wealth is referring to our surplus. Even the final word, money, that we read in English, is actually the same Greek word for wealth. The word that was once translated mammon in older English. It's a word in Greek that is likely related to a Hebrew word that means to trust in. Again, we see that we are not being derided for worshipping money as a concept, but we are being called to trust in God rather than trusting in having a lot to spare. And so we can either trust in wealth or we can trust in God. We can either idolise wealth or we can worship God. We can either serve wealth or serve God. Jesus wants us to be clear about this, so he puts it in four different ways. He opens with, no one can serve two masters. And we know by this point the masters he's referring to. That's the first way he tells us. Then the second way is like this. He explains, for either he will hate the one and love the other. Jesus saying that if you try and serve both outwardly, in your heart, you'll find yourself loving the one and hating the other. And so you can only serve one wholeheartedly. And then Jesus puts it the opposite way as he tells us a third time, and he puts a slightly different emphasis. Or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. These are different words here. In the first instance, we're looking at a heart attitude. But if we have a heart attitude, this will lead to an action problem. That word devoted, meaning to cling to, to be close to. And that word despise, to mean look down upon, to scorn, to contempt. 
Because of how you are feeling towards one master or the other, you will draw close to one and want to get away from the other. Anyone who has had the unfortunate experience of having two different managers over them in their work will know that if there is any conflict of interest between two managers, you will only be able to serve one. I was once put in this very position. I was put in charge of Christmas hiring at Marks and Spencers. I was given a corporate framework for hiring and the mission of hiring about 40 staff. My manager's manager, the commercial manager for the food department, and someone I got on with very well, he said to me something along these lines. Alex, we need to get people in as quickly as possible so we can get them trained up in time for Christmas. By whatever means, put through anyone who's breathing. <laughs> Those were his words. It was about, if they, in his view... There's something admirable about this. If someone is breathing, they can be trained, even if that meant I needed to fudge the paperwork a little bit. So that's my manager's manager. But the store manager, who had greater authority, who was further up the chain, but who I rarely saw, she instructed me very specifically. She said to me, Alex, I want to maintain a high standard for the staff here. Anyone who is only just over the line according to the corporate criteria, don't hire. If you have any question in your mind about any of the people in front of you, don't bring them on board. I could not adopt both policies towards hiring. I had to choose. I remember trying to go and speak to my manager's manager and try and reconcile these two ideas, but I was put on the spot to choose between them. Whichever manager I chose to ignore would certainly take it personally. In the end, I went with the store manager, partly because she had superior authority and partly because I favoured her approach, but this did not endear me to my manager's manager, and I still wonder which was the wisest choice. I'll leave the story there, but you get the idea. You cannot serve two masters. More pointedly, it would appear that the children of divorce have a similar problem. This does not always happen, but two warring parents often cause a child to have to choose between them. It's sadly so often the case that a child will be encouraged to love the one and hate the other, to cling to one and be apart from the other. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. And so far as this is perceivable as a reality of the situations we find ourselves in on earth, we are being told by God that we cannot serve wealth and him. And so the parable has given us instructions and then it has given us two warnings. The instruction is that our wealth is for serving others. If we use our wealth in this way, we will gain eternal dwellings. The first warning is this. If you are unfaithful with your earthly wealth, you will not be given anything that is your own in heaven. And the second warning is you cannot serve God and money. And so we come back to our question back before the castle gate. Whom do you serve? Do you serve God or money? If after what you have heard this morning, you would still choose wealth over God then I would remind you that there is no wealth that you can take with you. That when you reach the judgment, you will be judged to have misused the life you were given and your rejection of God will be judged. You will be sent for an eternal punishment and regret your choice of worthless wealth forever. 
if after what I have said you are still uncertain as to who you serve at the present time. Not sure whether it's wealth or God who you truly serve. Then I would ask you the question, which sounds better? To serve temporary wealth or be in right relation with God and share in his kingdom forever? What is it that you love? What is it that you hate? Do you love God and truly hate wealth? Or do you hate wealth and love God? What is it you cling to? What is it you despise? Do you cling to God and despise wealth? Or do you clutch hold of your money and despise God and his purposes for that wealth? If you are uncertain because you have been trying to serve both masters, then Jesus has said in four different ways, you cannot serve both. You cannot hedge your bets. If you know in your heart that you have certainly chosen God and despised money, then you'll have to bear with me for another moment. For these warnings do not apply to you. If after what you've heard you would like to be certain and your answer to the question of whom do you serve is I would like to serve God. If for the first time you would choose God rather than wealth then the herald cries from the gates and asks for the final time do you serve my Lord the King or some other master? Imagine with Lee, finally, that you realise that the final cry, that the doors of the castle have swung open, that the archers have disappeared, and you can see the king clearly on top of the parapet. If you wish to enter, then the sort of answer that you need to give is an answer that all will need to be able to hear clearly. And you will need to be able to give it wholeheartedly. The answer I have given, and I would encourage you to give, goes something like this. My Lord, the King who is on high, I know that you can hear me for you are God. I know your name because I have been told by your messages that your name is Jesus and I have been told that even though I previously served other masters, you have already paid the penalty of death for me. And now that you have been raised to the highest throne, I know that if I call upon your name, my King, the sin of my rebellion against you will be washed away because you were executed for me. And I can come into your kingdom even at this late hour and serve you forever. Friend, this is just one expression of faith. If you would cry out to God today, if you find for, your, for the first time that you are appalled with yourself for your love of money and all other earthly things, and you find in yourself for the first time a love for Jesus, if you trust in his death on a cross, then the sin of your previous allegiances will be removed because he died for them on a cross. And because he was raised from the dead, you can call upon his name and enter into his kingdom today. You will be adopted by the king of kings. You will enter into his kingdom. You will be in right relationship with almighty God. You will be filled with his Holy Spirit who will enable you to continue to serve God and despise wealth. Whilst you remain on earth, he has instructions for you. And if you follow these instructions, which you will, by the Spirit's power, you will gain more riches in heaven. And when you die, you will enter into eternal life, eternal relationship with the Father, internal treasuring of Christ and treasures that will never perish. 
He has brought you in this moment before the gates of the kingdom. He has made a way for you to enter, even in this late hour, if you call upon his name. The gate is open. One question remains. Whom do you serve? Let me pray for us. Father God, you speak to us in such a way as to challenge us that we might be rescued from the death that wealth brings. Lord, even those of us that have chosen you might detect in this moment that we have not been as faithful as we ought to be in keeping with the way of your salvation. that we have partly and temporarily chosen to trust in wealth rather than you. Lord, forgive us for this, I pray. Lord, help each of us here to be truly those who are devoted to you, who love you. Lord, build in us a great hatred for wealth. Help us to run from trusting in it. Lord, I ask you for any here whose hearts need to be changed so that they might love you and hate wealth. Lord, I pray that by your Spirit's power you would enable those here who need to to cry out to you in your name. Lord, your word says this is the way by which we enter, by placing our faith and our trust in you, Jesus. Lord, I ask that many would enter the kingdom today. Lord, be with us as we go from this place. Help us to go in the light of your truth. And whatever wealth you would trust us with, help us to spend it shrewdly and wisely. Investing in making friends for the kingdom. Investing in the poor and the needy, investing in those who cannot repay. Lord, help us to treasure you above all things in this life and in the age to come. Lord, we know we need your help in order to achieve this. Do this by your Spirit's power, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.